Freud's rejection of the Christian view of man could hardly have been more complete. He was a sort of Victorian scientific rationalist who wanted to increase the control of the rational conscious ego. Yet his thinking left a loophole. All his life he was fascinated by the archaic and he collected these marvellous statuettes, oriental, primitive and classical. He saw them as revealing something of the unconscious mind. He knew that the unconscious is the real dynamo of the personality and it's far older and greater than the conscious. And it thinks in mythical, magical and religious ways. It's the persistence in us of the archaic religious mind. And a follower of Freud's might well say to himself, why is Freud so preoccupied with his rationalism? Surely to achieve human wholeness, what we need is a marriage between the conscious and the unconscious. Perhaps the unconscious only seems so threatening and disorderly because we've become so alienated from it. But in reality, we need it. Here, perhaps, is the germ of a new understanding of religion. And Freud had a follower whose thought went along these lines. He was Carl Gustav Jung. Almost 20 years Freud's junior, Jung was the son of a Swiss pastor. He had already successfully applied and developed some of Freud's ideas when the two men met in 1907 and became close friends. But by 1912, profound disagreements on the centrality of sexuality in Freud's theory and on the place of religion, led to a complete and painful break. Jung had settled in this house in Kusnacht, near Zurich, where he practiced as a psychotherapist for the rest of his life. The inscription he set above his door proclaimed his personal starting point. Whether called upon or not, God will be present. It's an answer given by the Delphic Oracle in reply to a question about a coming battle. But for Jung, it means the religious question is inescapable. Sooner or later, the unconscious catches up with you. And it crystallizes the difference between Freud and Jung that led to the break in 1912. Freud had dealt mainly with neurotics, people he could talk to, and he saw his task as that of strengthening the rational ego so it could cope with life. But Jung, as a psychiatrist in a mental hospital, had dealt with the altogether more fearsome world of true madness, psychosis, where the ego is overwhelmed by the violence of the unconscious. He came to think that only religion could name the powers that then take over the mind and pilot the way towards spiritual health. These ideas were shortly to be tested in his own experience. During the years 1913 to 1919, Jung experienced a midlife crisis, as Freud had done at the same age. For years, strange forces and fantasies surfaced from his unconscious. He recorded it all in notebooks and paintings. He recognized that the images that kept cropping up were not purely personal. Rather, they were drawn from the primeval world of myth and symbolism. But what was the meaning of this violent eruption? The first indication that Jung's experiences might have a constructive purpose came when he painted his first mandala in 1916. The figure is a kind of diagram of the spiritual life, of a kind best known in Himalayan Buddhism, though similar figures are found in many other religions, including Christianity. They're used as aids to meditation. The opposed forces at the circumference are resolved at the still center. So Jung's approach to therapy is based on a more optimistic view of the unconscious. Let me tell you a story which happened a long while ago. I was sent a young patient who suffered from incurable insomnia. She was a teacher who had successfully completed her studies, but who lived in constant fear of making a mistake. 
she'd got into an unbearable state of spasmodic tension. I tried to explain to her that psychic relaxation was necessary, that I, for example, found relaxation by sailing on the lake, by letting myself go with the wind, that this was good for one, necessary for everybody. But I could see by her eyes that she didn't understand. Then, as I talked of sailing and of the wind, I heard the voice of my mother singing a lullaby to my little sister, as she used to do when I was eight or nine. A story of a little girl in a little boat on the Rhine with little fishes. And I began, almost without doing it on purpose, to hum what I was telling her about the wind, the waves, the sailing and relaxation, to the tune of the little lullaby. I could see that she was enchanted. Years later, her doctor told me she came back cured, and I always wanted to know what you had done. All she could tell me was some story about sailing and the wind, and I never could get her to tell me what you really did. How was I to explain to him that I had simply listened to something within myself? How was I to tell him that I had sung her a lullaby with my mother's voice? Enchantment like that is the oldest form of medicine. But it all happened outside of my reason. It was not until later that I thought about it rationally and tried to arrive at the laws behind it. She was cured by the grace of God. At Bollingen, near Zurich, Jung built, largely with his own hands, the house he called the Tower. It was his own personal retreat, where he spent more and more time in the last 30 years of his life. Coming to the Tower was an act of recollection, as Jung withdrew into a place which was itself an expression of his own psyche in stone. Here, everything has its history and mine. Here is space for the spaceless kingdom of the worlds and the psyche's hinterland. There is nothing to disturb the dead, neither electric light nor telephone. I tend the fireplace and stove myself. Evenings, I light the old lamps. There's no running water and I pump water from the well. I chop the wood and cook the food. These Simple acts make man simple. How difficult it is to be simple. In Bollingen, silence surrounds me almost audibly, and I live in modest harmony with nature. Thoughts rise to the surface which reach back into the centuries. From the beginning, I felt the tower was in some way a maternal womb in which I could become what I was, what I am, and will be. It gave me a feeling as if I were being reborn in stone. At times, I feel as if I am spread out over the landscape and inside things, and am myself living in every tree, in the clouds, in the procession of the seasons. We moderns are faced with the necessity of rediscovering the life of the spirit. We must experience it anew for ourselves. It is the only way in which we can break the spell that binds us to the cycle of biological events. Different thinkers draw the line between science and religion in different ways. Jung draws it along the frontier between the conscious and the unconscious minds. He always accepted that natural science gives us our only knowledge of the external physical world. But there's another world, also a common world, the inner world of the psyche. It expresses itself in the language of myth. And for Jung, religion is about that inner world and about the task of bringing the inner and outer worlds into harmony. All his life, he made objects in order to express and articulate 
his inner myths. Here's one that he made in 1958 when he was 83 years old. A primitive woman figure who stands for the anima, the feminine principle in his own psyche, is reaching up to draw milk from a mare, life-giving milk. It's looking forward to the age of Aquarius when the feminine principle will be dominant, an age that stands under the constellation of Pegasus, the horse. Jung's psyche is prophesying the future. Not that Jung himself ever took such ideas literally. Rather, he sees our dreams, our fantasies and our art as carrying messages from our psyche that point out to us the path of our own future spiritual fulfilment. The three sections of the completed tower represented for Jung the trinity and the three parts of the soul. The heart of it, Jung's private meditation room, is still locked. Below, the open courtyard stands for nature. The whole complex makes up Jung's quaternity, the fourfold harmony, his favorite symbol for integration. Not surprisingly, Jung's approach to religion has been criticized. From his starting point, all religious ideas are equally valid as expressions of human psychic life. And all religious truths and religious objects are simply psychological. So he could be led up some pretty strange byways, not only astrology, but also alchemy and Gnosticism. And in his collected works, at least, he never speaks of God as being more than the God image in the human psyche. Nevertheless, within those limits, Jung was able to do a great deal. And in reply to charges of self-absorption or mysticism, he would answer that what our age most needs is a rediscovery of the life of the psyche. He would have said that he was performing a public service by retreating into his tower. Not only do I leave the door open for the Christian message, but I consider it of central importance for Western man. It needs, however, to be seen in a new light in accordance with the changes wrought by the contemporary spirit. Otherwise, it stands apart from the times and has no effect on man's wholeness. The idea of God is an absolutely necessary psychological function of an irrational nature which has nothing whatever to do with the question of God's existence. The human intellect can never answer this question, still less give any proof of God. Moreover, such proof is superfluous, for the idea of an all-powerful divine being is present everywhere, unconsciously if not consciously, because it is an archetype. I therefore consider it wiser to acknowledge the idea of God consciously, for if we do not, something else is made God, usually something quite inappropriate and stupid, such as only an enlightened intellect could hatch forth. And did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. What did Jung mean by claiming at the end of his life to know God? Remember the journey he'd taken. As a young man, he'd broken away from religion and joined Freud. He accepted Darwin's revolution in our understanding of man's place in nature. He accepted that the human mind is an evolutionary product and religion a natural psychological function. Religious beliefs give mythic, projected expression to our inner states. Well, all this was standard 19th century atheist doctrine. Yet, when Jung turned back to religion, he didn't discard it. He took it with him. If our religious beliefs are clues to our inner lives, then in all their forms they're equally valuable and instructive. So Jung became perhaps the first genuinely multi-faith religious thinker. But even more original was Jung's new form of religious naturalism. Before him, those who'd grasped that religion is indeed fully human had always ended up as unbelievers, people like Marx and Freud. But Jung finds a way back. Realizing that religion is truly human, he sets aside supernaturalism and instead he brings forward the old mystical idea that the knowledge of God is, in the end, the same thing as self-knowledge. 
For Jung, the knowledge of God means a condition of inner integration, blessedness, wisdom, harmony with oneself and all nature, that our psyches are pursuing all our lives. So far, Freud's position, his public reputation, has been higher. But Jung's new sort of religious naturalism has a lot to teach all of us. Indeed, I suspect in the end we're all going to have to follow him. And here at Bollingham, it's surely right to give him the last word. My life is the story of the self-realization of the unconscious. What we are to our inward vision can only be expressed by way of myth. Myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than does science. Thus it is that I have undertaken to tell my personal myth. We cannot make any final judgment about ourselves or our lives. At bottom we never know how it has all come about. The life of man is a dubious experiment. It is a tremendous phenomenon only in numerical terms. Individually it is so fleeting that it is literally a miracle that anything can exist and develop at all. In the end, the only events in my life worth telling are those when the imperishable world erupted into this transitory one. Everything else has lost importance by comparison. I can understand myself only in the light of inner happenings. It is these that make up the singularity of my life.